Hello everyone and welcome to today's Dynamics 365 Tech Talk where today's topic is Introduction to Warehouse Management. My name is Evan and I'll be your moderator today. We are broadcasting this web conference through Teams Live events and the audio can be heard through your device speakers. Today's web conference is being recorded on behalf of the Microsoft Corporation and by participating in the session using Microsoft Teams, your name, email address, phone number, and or title may be viewable by other session participants. If you do not consent to being part of a recorded session, please disconnect at this time. The recording will be available on the Tech Talks Community Dynamics page within five business days. If you have questions for the presenters or need support, please use the Q&A panel located on the right side of your screen. Our presenters will be responding to your questions throughout the event. Thank you for your patience during these announcements. Now let's get started. Presenting for us today from Microsoft, we have Nicole Gunn, Senior Program Manager. Nicole, over to you. Thanks, Evan. Welcome everyone to the introduction to Warehouse Management Tech Talk. This Tech Talk is meant to be an introductory or 100 level course introducing the basics of using the Warehouse Management Module in Dynamics 365 for finance and operations or supply chain management. So if you are looking for a deeper dive on warehouse management or more advanced topics, this may not be the session that you were looking for, um, but please still feel free to join us or watch the recording at a later time. Um, but do keep an eye on the calendar for upcoming tech talks as we will be doing a series of warehouse management sessions that do go deeper into configuration um, as well as some industry focused sessions as well. All right, let's get started. So our agenda for this session will be to cover terminology, fundamental configurations in warehouse management, our core constructs, the mobility component of warehouse management, and then I will end uh, by doing some business process demos in a Contoso environment. So for terminology, I'm gonna start with a few acronyms that are common when working with a warehouse management module. And the first one is WMS, and it's probably the most common one that you will hear. And it literally stands for the warehouse management system. And when we are talking about Dynamics 365, that encompasses our warehouse management module as well as the mobility component, which is our WMA or Warehouse Mobile Application or App, or you may hear it referred to as WM App. Those are all the same thing, and they're referring to the standalone application that is typically installed and run on a handheld scanning device to be used in the warehouse. The next common acronym uh, that you will encounter is RTW, which stands for Release to Warehouse. This is one of our core processes um, in warehouse management, and it will be defined a little bit later on in the presentation as well. And then finally, LP, uh, which stands for license plate. Another very common one, if you are familiar with using the old uh, inventory management warehousing functionality in AX um, or earlier versions of Dynamics, uh, then you will be familiar with the pallet ID inventory dimension and the LP is similar to that concept in that it is a grouping of items or a like item with maybe different batches of the same item. And the LP is meant to group those together to make movement and processing in the warehouse more efficient. So I'm going to continue with some terminology um, and some common terms uh, that you will hear when working with warehouse management. So the first one of those is waves. You may also hear the term 
in the singular as wave or waving or wave processing. All of those are just referring to um, a collection of order lines that are released to the warehouse at the same time for processing. So that is what we consider a wave. And then a load or loads are our physical shipping containers. So think of this as a tractor trailer um, that you would ship product out of your warehouse on. And then for shipments, these are our individual deliveries to a specific customer or specific delivery address. And finally, work. And work is the transaction that is performed by an end user, typically on that warehouse mobile app to complete any number of different business processes in the warehouse from receiving to picking to shipping. So let's review some of the fundamental configurations that are required to use the warehouse management module. So the first several I'll go through here are all item related setups. So the very first one is the storage dimension group. You may already be familiar with that configuration. The important point to note for warehouse management is that is there a parameter on the storage dimension group to enable the use of warehouse management. When you do that, um, it activates a specific set of inventory dimensions that are used in the storage dimension group. And they include um, dimensions that are not otherwise activated, such as the license plate that we talked about, as well as the inventory status. Another item set up is the tracking dimension group. So the tracking dimension group allows us to use lot control or serialized items with our warehouse management processes. So the important point with the tracking dimension group is that if you're going to use one of those dimensions that you want to set those to be active as well as um, active for physical inventory to be used with warehouse management. And then the reservation hierarchies. These are very important um, and they define how our inventory is allocated to demand based on our set of inventory dimensions that were activated in our storage dimension group. They also relate to the tracking dimension group in that if you have active tracking dimensions such as a batch or a serial, that those dimensions should also be included in your reservation hierarchy so that warehouse management knows how to allocate um, the inventory based on those dimensions as well. And I do have an example here, a graphic of a standard reservation hierarchy. So this one does not include any tracking dimensions. So this just includes our core five inventory dimensions. The site warehouse and inventory status are pictured above this solid line I have drawn in the graphic to indicate that these are the dimensions that the system is looking for when we soft allocate inventory. So this is at the point of order entry or initial reservation of inventory. The system is simply going to look um, at whether you have enough inventory at the site um, that's on the order line in this specified warehouse and in the specified inventory status, such as available inventory to meet the demand. The inventory dimensions below the line, location and license plate are only considered once we release that order line to the warehouse for processing. So in that release to warehouse process, we then get a hard allocation of inventory where the system is actually looking at the specific location within that site warehouse inventory status to direct the user to pick the inventory. And that is the location that then gets assigned to the work transaction. So some additional fundamental configurations that we have. 
Uh, another one that is item related is the unit sequence group. So the unit sequence group is the only mandatory configuration on the warehouse tab of your release product setup. So this is the one thing that defines our handling units within the warehouse. So on your item, you've got you know, an inventory unit defined, maybe a different selling unit or purchasing unit, but the unit sequence group is telling the warehouse management module specifically, what physical units do you handle the product in? And it may just be one, it may just be whatever your inventory unit is, um, but if it is multiple, um, say your vendor ships you, you know, eaches uh, that come in a box and then they stack those boxes on a pallet, then you have eaches and boxes and pallets all defined within your unit sequence group. The important thing with the unit sequence group is to note that it also works in conjunction with the unit conversions then that are defined on that item. So if I am using those multiple handling units, I also want to define the unit conversions on the item to tell the system not only what units in the unit sequence group, but how many units in the unit conversion. Our sites, warehouses, and locations that we set up represent our distribution network. And I'll explain that a little bit more. We've got a graphic on that. And then our wave templates, location directives, and work templates are our three core um, configurations that drive what we call the how, where, what um, of the warehouse processes. I am not going to dive any deeper on these specific configurations in this session since we are in an introductory session. But if you have questions um, on these specific setups or are just interested in kind of some tips and tricks for how to set those up efficiently, um, then we will be having a, a separate tech talk on deep diving into these configurations. Uh, so please look for that in the coming uh, weeks and months. So I've got a couple of examples here um, for some of the configurations we just talked about. Uh, the first one is that unit sequence group. So you can see at the bottom level, so if we read this bottom up, uh, the first unit we define in the sequence group should be our inventory unit. Uh, that's very important. Uh, so the lowest level should be your inventory unit. Um, in this case, I have eaches. The next unit in my hierarchy here is a box. And you can see from the graphic that in this example, I have two eaches that go into one box. And then at the top level, I've got boxes that go into a pallet. And again, in this graphic, I have two boxes that go into my pallet. So we can infer from this graphic that a single pallet at the lowest level has four eaches, even though that's not displayed here. The distribution hierarchy, um, so this is where we set up our sites and our warehouses and locations. I've depicted it in a pyramid because this is really how we want to think about um, the setup. So your sites at the very top um, are a collection of warehouses that are typically within the same geographical region. So that might be something like the Pacific Northwest as my region in the United States. At the next level down in our warehouses, this represents either a virtual or physical space within my distribution network. So if my site is the Pacific Northwest, I may have a warehouse in Seattle. And then underneath of each of those warehouses, I have a collection of locations and those again can represent a virtual or physical space where our product is being transacted or stored. So a specific location within my Seattle warehouse might be my receiving dock. So that is all for the fundamental configurations. So let's move to the core constructs that are important for us to understand 
when working with warehouse management. So the first one is that release to warehouse process or wave process that we spoke about earlier in the terminology. So this is kind of our engine um, within warehouse management that creates work as an output. So our inputs are our demand lines, our order lines, and then it is also considering the configurations that we spoke about, the wave templates, work templates, and location directives. It's putting that into our engine and it's processing uh, everything to create work for us as an output. We then want to understand what are loads, shipments, and containers. So we defined loads and shipments earlier as our physical shipping container and then our deliveries to customer, respectively. Containers are then a loose package um, that would be the result of either a manual or automated packing process that you may be using within warehouse management. Um, containers are not always used because packing is not always required um, in your business process. But altogether, the loads, shipments, and containers represent our hierarchy of transit. There is a graphic on this as well to, to explain that a little bit more. And then work. Work is our concept. We defined it a little bit earlier. This is our transaction that is comprised of pick and put steps in pairs. So our work templates are what define that structure of the picks and puts. So if you've got staging operations, um, then there may be additional steps in your work. And here is that graphic that I spoke about for the transit hierarchy. So we want to read this from left to right and, and think of it as kind of a sideways pyramid where the top of the pyramid is our loads. So again, that's our tractor trailer, our physical shipping container, and it contains one to many shipments within the load. The shipments then, if we expand our pyramid, this is the middle column of shipments, are our deliveries to customers. And they are going to contain one to many containers, if I am using that packing process, or just contain the individual order lines themselves. So at the very lowest level, uh, my containers then, or just my individual order lines, have my individual items. So let's talk a bit um, about the mobility side of warehouse management. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is the mobile structure and configuration within Dynamics 365. So these are the configurations within the warehouse management module uh, that you will want to set up in order to use the application, which we will talk about afterwards. So the structure um, is that we have a set of configurable menus and menu items. So these are the actual buttons or options on the app that the user will be interacting with. There is then a set of default setups that we need to enable. And then we also need to set up our workers in warehouse management. And these are the actual users that are logging in to the mobile app. So here's just an example of that mobile structure. So our menus and menu items. So reading again from, from left to right, when I log into the application, I may see this main menu that shows me all of the options that I have access to. So here I then drill down into a receiving menu or a shipping menu. If I choose the receiving menu, I then may see a purchase or a transfer menu item that allows me to do those types of receipts. If I back up in the menu structure, and you can go forward and backwards um, in the application, you'll see me do that during the demos. If I instead choose the shipping menu, 
I may see a sales picking menu item that allows me to pick my sales orders. So I want to review the default setups that we need to enable in the system before we start using the app. So I've put the full menu path for how to get to these forms um, in the slide deck and you'll get a copy of this afterwards. But the first one is the warehouse app field names form. The first time that you access this form, it will be blank here in the main section of the form. So when you click the create default setup, it populates all of this setup for you. You do not need to change anything from the default setup unless a requirement comes up um, that would necessitate that. So for example, um, if I look at the confirm batch line here, the fourth line in the form, I can see that the input mode is set to manual, meaning if my user needs to confirm the batch that they've got to manually enter the batch number. Um, if I instead want to change that to scanning because my batch number is barcoded, say on a label that came either from the vendor or from our manufacturing process, then I can change that to scanning. And then when the user is prompted to confirm a batch, they will instead be able to scan um, versus being forced to do a manual entry. So you can edit the defaults. The other default setup that we want to create is under the warehouse app field priority. Again, I've included the full uh, menu path here. When you log into this form, um, it will not be blank, but all of these fields that you see on the right hand side will initially be on the left under the unassigned fields. And when you select the create default setup button, they will be moved to the right hand side of the form under the assigned fields and they will be given these default priority settings. The important thing here to note is that this controls where the user sees information on the app. So the priority 10 is the most critical and that is displayed to the user on their main tab of the app or the task tab. Um, any other priority below that, priority 20, 30, 40, all of those show up on the details tab in the app. That is not typically the tab that the user is going to see or work with. So if there's critical information that they need as they're processing, then that information should be on the priority 10. So again, if there's information that's not in the default, um, you can move these fields up and down in priority. So just know that that is an option. So if I want to move that confirm batch that we spoke about earlier, it's priority 40. If I don't want that to be on the details tab, I could move it all the way up to priority 10 and then the user would see it on their main or task tab in the app and I will show that um, in the demos. And then finally, we want to set up our workers. Again, I've included the path to get to this form. These are the users that are actually logging into the app um, and not to be confused with the system administration module uh, users or AAD users um, and also not to be confused with our HR uh, module workers because that form is also called workers. But when we create a new record here, um, it is going to ask us to select one of those worker records to attach our user to. And once we select that worker, we can create a new user in the middle part of the form. And then this is the user ID and you'll assign a password, which is then encrypted, but can be reset here um, to the person who's going to actually log into the app. Um, you'll see that there's like a one to many relationship here in the Contoso data. Um, there's a user kind of created for every warehouse that that person's logging into. Um, but the best practice um, set up here is that we would have many records here, so many worker records, and each of them would have ideally one user ID attached to the worker. 
um, and that's just for security so you can um, disable users um, and things like that more effectively. So then as far as the warehouse mobile application itself, um, you'll see it in the demos, but I've included a screenshot of just the main menu um, from the Kintoso data. So there is a full Microsoft Docs article out there on how to install the application and how to you know, register it and set it up and connect it to your specific environment. Um, but you can just go to the Microsoft Store and download the app and use it in a demo mode to get a look and feel of the UI and how the menu structures work. The app is supported um, on any Windows 10 or Android device. So there is not a specific set of hardware devices that Microsoft recommends that you use. As long as that device um, supports Windows 10 or Android, you can download the application. You can also just download it directly um, to a tablet or to your desktop. You will see me using the desktop um, version and it, it's exactly the same version, but you'll see me using it on the desktop um, in the demos. So I'm going to pause here. Um, Zach, is there anything that came up in the Q&A that you'd like me to address before we go to demos? Uh, no, Nicole, I think we're good. I think you can go forward. OK, thanks, Zach. So let's get into the fun stuff. Um, so the business process demos I'm going to cover are just five kind of fundamental processes that you would do with the warehouse management module. The first one is receiving a purchase order from a vendor. We're then going to move inventory within our warehouse from location to location. We're going to cycle count inventory within the warehouse. And in this case, it's going to be um, an ad hoc um, cycle count, not one that was planned. I'm then going to pick and ship a sales order out of the warehouse and then turn around and receive a return order from that shipment. All right, so let me switch over to our my Contoso environment. And I'm going to bring up my mobile application as well. So here is the mobile application on the desktop. And this is exactly what it would look like. Um, if you log into it from a handheld device as well. So the first thing I'm gonna do is show you um, a purchase order that I have already created in the system, but it's going to be the one that we are receiving against. So let's take a look at it. So I've got a purchase order from my vendor for 100 pieces of this item A0001. And all of this is just in the Contoso data. I'm working in warehouse 24. Um, so if you're interested in doing some testing on your own with warehouse management um, and you've got a set of uh, Contoso data in your environment, the warehouse 24 is a good one to work with because it is enabled for all of the warehouse management processes. So in my application, if I want to receive this purchase order, so if I am the warehouse worker that is on the receiving dock um, and a shipment has arrived from the vendor um, at the dock, then I should have some paperwork, ideally, um, from the vendor that I can go ahead and start my receiving process with. So I'm going to go into the inbound menu and I'm going to go into purchase receive. So just a note before I begin that the Contoso data is set up in a two step receiving process meaning I'm first gonna have to register the inventory, and then I'm going to do a separate put away process to move the inventory from my receiving dock into my storage in the warehouse. This can be configured as a one-step process. It is just happens to be a two-step process in the Contoso data, so that's how we're gonna walk through it. So we're assuming two different people are gonna do these processes. So purchase receive is the first one. I'm going to scan my PO number um, or enter it, um, however the vendor has given you this information. 
and then the item number as well. And then it's going to ask me what quantity am I receiving? Um, I've already done some receiving against this PO. I'm not going to do the full quantity. Um, I'm only going to bring in, let's say, 30 pieces from this PO. And then this is going to give me an option to verify my item, my quantity, and the unit of measure for this item. I'm going to pause here and just talk briefly about um, something we mentioned earlier, which is the priority, the warehouse app field priority setup, and how it displays information on the task tab versus the details tab. So you can see here, this task tab is the main one that I'm working in. I've got some information that is displayed to me at the bottom, and that is based on that priority 10 information. If I switch to the details tab, I may see some additional information that is not displayed to me, such as the PO line number, and that would be anything that, that's in that priority 20 and below on that setup. You will see um, if I expand this, so if I were working in a tablet view, then you can see that I see both the task pane and the details pane at the same time. I may also be able to see a product image if those are loaded and being utilized in the system. I'm gonna collapse this back down so it's more of a application size. So I'm going to go ahead and confirm that this is what I'm receiving for my IPO. And it's going to tell me that work is completed. Really what this means in this case is that work was created for me to then complete in the second step of the purchase uh, receiving process, which is the put away. But I'm going to show you that work um, before we complete it on the application. So at this point in time, if I look at my PO, um, I have registered inventory. So basically, I've just recognized that that physical inventory has arrived at my warehouse. There has been no financial um, transaction that has happened. It will not until you actually post a product receipt against the PO um, later on. That's not necessarily part of the warehouse process, so I'm not going to go through it here. Um, but I do want to show the work that was created. So I've got this open purchase order put away work, and it's telling me that my material handler or whoever's going to move this inventory is going to pick up what I just received from my receiving dock location and put it away into this floor 001 location that was determined through my location directive setup. So I'm going to go back to the application. I'm going to scan this target license plate ID for reference. Um, you know, in a real world scenario, you probably have a license plate uh, label being printed out during that registration process that would include this license plate ID. That way, the person who's going to do the put away would have a license plate barcode to scan as they're going to move the inventory. So I'm still in the inbound menu but I'm going to go to the purchase put away option this time. So this is my second step. And you'll see this is why I copied that ID because I, I don't have a label or a barcode, um, but I'm just going to do a copy paste to simulate that. I could also scan the work ID directly, um, but it's not as common in a purchase receiving process that you would you know, print a put away ticket with the work ID on it. Um, more likely you're going to have the license plate ID. So if I scan the license plate, the application recognizes that this is where that license plate is currently sitting and this is what's on it. So again, our license plate is representing a group of items or products um, that allow us to efficiently move them around the warehouse. In this case, it's just one product, but it is 30 pieces of a product. If these are large pieces, um, then these may be 30 pieces of something that are you know, stacked and, and shrink wrapped on an actual wooden pallet, if that helps you to think about it that way. So I'm going to just verify that, yes, that is what I picked up. In the Contoso data, the purchase put away option is set up for what is called user grouping that allows the user who's doing put away to pick up multiple um, license plates at a time. 
So maybe they have a piece of equipment, such as a long fork or turret truck that accommodates that. Um, and then they would be more efficient in, you know, picking up two or three pallets at a time and then putting them away instead of taking one, putting it away, coming back to the receiving dock and doing a lot of movement throughout the warehouse. I am not going to pick anything else up in this example. So I'm going to go ahead and say that I am done. And that leads me to the put away. So it's taking me to that floor 001 location and asking me to drop off my license plate there. If I had picked up multiple things, just note um, that it will ask you to do the put away in reverse order that you picked it up, which makes sense um, if you think about how you physically would be picking things up on your equipment. Uh, the last thing you picked up would be the first thing that you drop off or put away. So I'm going to confirm that, yes, I took this inventory to this floor 001 location, and now it tells me my work is completed. In this case, that really does mean it's completed, because um, if I refresh um, back here in Dynamics 365, I see that that work ID is now closed, and I can check my inventory, and I should see that license plate in this floor 001 location. So let's take a look at that. So here is my license plate and my 30 pieces of inventory are in floor 001. So that is our first business process of purchase order receiving. So I'm going to go ahead and move to the uh, move inventory process. So back in the application, any time um, that you need to get out of a task, you go to this hamburger menu, we call it, the, the three horizontal lines, and you're going to click cancel. That will step you back out into the menu you were in. And in this case, I'm no longer going to be doing an inbound uh, menu function, so I'm going to actually click back at the bottom of this menu, and that takes me back to the main menu and allows me um, to switch to the inventory menu where I'm going to do a movement. This is just a user directed movement, meaning um, the user has decided to pick up um, a certain license plate or part of a license plate and move it to another location that they are going to tell the system. Uh, the system is not directing the user in any way in this movement function. So I'm going to go ahead and scan that same license plate that I just received, and it's going to tell me exactly where that license plate is currently sitting. So it's in that floor 001 location, we know, because we just brought that in. Um, so I'm going to actually do a partial movement. Uh, you can move the full license plate, um, but I do want to show this. I'm going to go ahead and just move, let's say, 10 of the pieces. So it's going to ask me, where am I moving those 10 pieces to? So I'm going to pick another floor location. Maybe that floor 001 location um, was overfilled. And if I wasn't using any type of location stocking limits um, or volumetrics to control my capacity, then the system may have asked me to take that inventory to that floor 001 location. But when I actually got there, um, perhaps it was full and if I did not overwrite it in the, the purchase put away process, maybe I'm doing the secondary movement. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and scan the floor 005 location. So perhaps this is an empty location that has enough capacity for me to, to put these pieces. And you'll see that it's assigning a new license plate value for me. Um, and that is because I am not taking the full license plate quantity of 30 pieces. I am leaving 20 pieces on the initial license plate in the initial location. And a new license plate is being assigned to the 10 pieces that I am taking off of that initial license plate. So I'm going to go ahead and confirm uh, that license plate that it assigned. And it's telling me that that work is completed. So I'm going to do a couple of things here. If I refresh my on-hand inventory, I see that that initial license plate now only has 20 pieces. Also be able to see my other license plate, 
which ends in six two eight, has the ten pieces is now in the floor zero zero five location. All right, so that was the move inventory business process. So we're going to move to the third process, which is cycle counting our inventory. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to do what's called a spot cycle count or an ad hoc count. That just means that we did not generate the cycle count ahead of time, um, which you may do if you're doing recurring counts on a weekly, monthly, quarterly basis as part of your typical just business process. Um, this is more um, of an ad hoc count where maybe a user, you know, if they're walking down an aisle in the warehouse and they see something that's damaged, for example, then they may want to just go ahead and do an ad hoc count of that location because maybe they need to take inventory out or just to confirm um, what is left in that location. So I'm going to go ahead and cancel out of my movement task. And I am still doing an inventory task, so I'm going to stay in this menu and I'm going to move to the spot counting option. And I'm going to enter in that floor 005 location that we just moved our inventory to. And I'm going to enter in the item. That I'm counting and then it's going to ask me for the license plate as well. Um, it's prompting me for license plate because my floor locations are license plate controlled. Um, if you are not using license plate tracking in your storage locations in the warehouse, um, then it will not prompt you to count by license plate. That license plate will be essentially dropped um, from whichever transaction put the inventory into storage, such as that purchase put away. So it's asking me um, as the user to go ahead and count the quantity. I'm going to say that there's 12 pieces here. I know that's not right. So it's telling me with this lovely video game sound that the count differs from the on hand quantity. And it's going to give me one chance to retry my count. And that's just based on my configuration of this cycle counting menu item on the app. So I'm going to go ahead and count again. So that retry um, or recount is just to give the user a chance. Maybe they, you know, had fat fingers when they entered in the quantity the first time and they put 120 and they meant 12. Um, so the recount is nice because it, it gives them that option to correct it if that was the case. But in this case, I'm going to say, no, nope, my initial count was right. There's there's physically 12 pieces in the location that I'm counting. And it's going to go ahead and accept it that time. Um, I am going to say it looks like there's some other items maybe in this location that I am finished counting. This location. And then it's going to tell me, OK, you are complete, but do you want to add another LP or item to this location? So anytime you're cycle counting, whether it was a um, predetermined count that you're processing or an ad hoc count such as the one we just did, um, it's always going to prompt you at the end um, for adding a license plate or item to the location. So this is just the opportunity if the user sees an item, you know, physically in that location that they're counting, that the system did not prompt them to count, meaning the system does not think that it's in that location, then they can go ahead and add it here without doing a separate, you know, inventory adjustment. So that's just giving you the opportunity to add that. Uh, I'm not going to add anything in this demo. I'm just going to say OK. It's going to tell me the work is completed. I counted 12 pieces here. If I refresh this, you'll see that this did not adjust my inventory to 12 pieces. That is because there is a review process for the cycle counts that needs to occur. So as a supervisor or a manager or even an inventory auditor, um, someone would need to come in and the warehouse management uh, cycle counting uh, menu has some pre uh, filtered views and I'm going to go into the cycle count work pending review. You may choose to add that to your favorites or put it on a dashboard in a workspace. Um, if this is a, a function that you're typically doing as say an inventory auditor. 
but this is where I would come to see that cycle count that is now in a pending review status because I just counted it differently than what the system expected. So I'm going to go into the cycle count kind of subform from my work and it's going to show me everything in that location. Now you can see that there are a couple of other license plates, same item, but a couple of other license plates in that location that I did not count. The counted quantity was zero. For those, um, I'm not going to do anything with them. I'm gonna go ahead and reject the counted quantity of zero. Um, I actually, because I know that's not right because I didn't count them. Um, but for this one, uh, that I did count the system expected quantity was 10. That's what we had moved there from our previous process. And the counted quantity that I put in was 12. So it's showing me the variance by cost. So if that is a determining factor for whether or not you accept or reject that difference, um, then it, it is displayed here for you. Um, I am going to go ahead and accept it just to show that a journal is posted to make that inventory adjustment. And you can see the journal number here. And then if I go back into my uh, on-hand inventory, now I should see my inventory has been updated on that license plate to 12 pieces from 10 pieces because I accepted that uh, count variance. All right. Also, if I would go back, uh, let's just close the loop there. Um, I should no longer have anything in my cycle count work pending review because I completed that review. So that is our cycle count inventory process. I'm going to move to pick and ship sales order. I already have a sales order in the system. So I'm going to go ahead and show you that. I've got a couple of items on here. Um, that we've been working with. So we're going to pick and ship line three, which has 24 pieces of this item. The Contoso data um, has a default reservation policy of manual. So that means I need to reserve my inventory um, manually or through a batch process, but I'm going to do it manually for the demo. So if I come into the reservation form on my sales order line, I see that I've got 24 and I've got plenty of inventory to fulfill this. So I'm going to go ahead and say reserve lot and that's going to move um, my 24 pieces into the reserve physical state. And then I'm going to switch to. My release to warehouse form. And I can see that. Um, the default view is sales orders, but just to point out, you can also release transfer orders from this form. But we've got a sales order here, um, and you'll see that the quantity available to release is the 24 pieces, and that is what I have reserved. So it's always important to look at that um, because if the reservation is missing or has not been completed yet, you'll see that that is zero, or maybe it's a partial quantity. Maybe I only had 18 of my 24 pieces in inventory, and if I'm allowed to do partial shipments to my customer, um, then I may still go ahead and choose to release just the 18 pieces out of the 24 quantity, which is the order line quantity. So I'm going to go ahead and add this line um, to my release to warehouse. And I'm going to go ahead and click release to warehouse here. So this is essentially um, everything at the bottom of the form that gets added to that wave that we talked about. So you'll see these info log messages up here refer to waves as well as work that has been created. So that wave process happened um, when we did this release to warehouse. Uh, trigger here and it took my order line information. It considered all of my wave template work template location directive setups and ultimately it created work for me to complete. So let's go look at what that work uh, looks like. And actually, I'm going to show you um, from the sales order. 
and I'm not sure if I showed this from the purchase order earlier, um, but just this is one of the nice ways to get to the work detail for any specific order line is to go to the order, um, highlight the line that you're working with, and then go to the warehouse work details because this will present you a filtered view of the work that is just related to that order line versus going to the all work or work details form where you would see all types of work for all different orders and then you would have to do some filtering um, to find just this one particular piece of work. So I am going to um, switch tasks in the app again. I'm going to cancel out of the counting task I was doing, go back out of my inventory menu, and switch to outbound. And I'm going to do a sales picking process here. So in this case, um, I am going to scan the work ID because you may be printing a pick ticket that has the work ID barcoded um, that you would initiate this process with um, because we do have this sales picking set up as user uh, directed, not system directed. If you are in a paperless um, environment, if you want to save the planet, a few trees, um, and then you may choose to not print a pick list and use a more system directed option. But in this case, uh, we are not. So it's asking me um, to go pick this quantity of 24 pieces that I released um, from this floor 001 location. We know that we've got inventory of this product just because we've been working with it, moving it around, counting it in other locations, but it is going to direct me to the first alphanumeric location that it finds inventory in. Again, that's just a setup of the location directives, and we can cover that further in the configuration uh, deep dive tech talk. I'm going to scan a license plate value that I know has inventory in that location. And it, again, it's going to generate a target license plate for me. So much like that partial inventory movement we did, um, the system is doing this because that license plate that I scanned that I'm picking these 24 pieces from has far more than 24 pieces on it. So whatever is remaining is going to remain on that license plate in the storage location. And it's going to assign me a new license plate to take these 24 pieces with me throughout this picking transaction. I'm going to confirm that. And in my process and my work template does not have any additional uh, pick put steps as far as you know staging or packing. So I'm just going to put this directly to a bay door location. That is my final shipping location. Again, that's a setup of my warehouse management parameters, but basically that is important because it tells the system that is the final location that this inventory is going to be in. So once um, inventory is moved here, go ahead and deduct it from the physical on hand inventory. So I'm going to put my inventory there. I'm going to refresh the work just to show you that um, it is now closed and you can see that my user ID did this as well. So now that our inventory is at the bay door, I can go ahead and complete this um, shipping process, which I'm going to move through kind of quickly because um, I know we're coming up. We just got about seven minutes left and I, I do want to get through the return process as well. So our load is in a loaded status because everything is at our final shipping location. I'm going to go ahead and confirm that just updates my status to shipped. So I would typically do that um, as my product has actually left or my load has left my warehouse. I'm going to post a packing slip um, from the load as well. So this is our financial update of this inventory. It tells me that that was successful. I'm going to go back to my sales order. I can see that it posted that packing slip journal and I'm going to go ahead and invoice what was packing slip updated. That way I can do a return against the sales order line. So I am just moving a bit quickly through that process so that we can get to the return. So I'm going to go to return orders. I did create one earlier um, and I'm going to go ahead and use the find sales order feature to bring in this line. So here's my order line um, that I just shipped. I'm not going to bring back all 24 pieces. Maybe my customer had an issue with just a, a half a dozen, six of these. Uh, maybe a, a pack of them were damaged. 
So I'm going to add that. You'll see I've got a negative quantity on my return. And I'm going to send the return order. Um, that's typically a, it'll generate a document that you could send to the customer um, to essentially authorize that return um, coming back into your inventory. This is our final process. Let me bring this back up. I'm just waiting for it to generate that um, return order document. So I'm going to go ahead on the application and get ready to receive this return order. So I'm going to cancel out of my sales picking operation, go back in my menu. You can see that if I've got several options, I can scroll um, through the app. I'm gonna go back to an inbound process and this time uh, we're going to do an RMA receive. It will again be a two step process versus one step. Uh, this is just asking me to generate the document. I'm gonna go ahead and scan in my RMA number here. And I can see on my um, return order authorization form that I've got my RMA number here, 00034, and that's gonna be the one that I scan into the app. It's gonna ask me for the item. So this flow should feel very similar to the purchase receipt. And I'm in, in this case, the system is not going to generate a license plate value here. It's going to ask me to assign one. So I may have you know, a pre-printed roll um, of barcodes that I can assign, so I could scan that in here. I'm just gonna go ahead and type a value. And then it's gonna ask me for that quantity. I'm gonna put in all six. And then in the return process, we have this additional function of assigning a disposition code. And this allows you um, through, again, your location directive setup, um, which we will cover in a later session, to route these returns to different areas in your warehouse based on the disposition code. In this case, I'm gonna pick that credit. It tells me work completed. Again, that kind of means work created in our scenario. So I'm gonna cancel out. I'm gonna go to an RMA and, oh, sorry, not put away. That's the one step process. I'm gonna go to RMA put away. And I will show you quickly um, if I go to this return sales order, so anytime you create the RMA, you get the corresponding uh, sales order that's also generated of type return order. And again, I can go to that warehouse work detail to see that filtered view of the return order put away work that was created. So I'm gonna go ahead and scan that work ID and enter it into my RMA put away. And again, this should feel very similar to that um, purchase put away flow where I'm, I'm picking up from the receiving doc. I'm verifying the item and quantity I picked up and it's telling me this time to not put it away into my inventory, but to put it to this return location because maybe I need to do a quality inspection or some other process before I can say that this can return to inventory or maybe it's damage, it needs to be scrap, whatever the determination is. So I'm gonna put it in the return location tells me work is complete, and I can see that here, um, my work is complete. So that's the final process. Um, let me go ahead and uh, reshare. So these are the five processes that we went through, receiving a purchase order from the vendor, moving our inventory between locations in the warehouse, doing an ad hoc or spot cycle count of the inventory, picking and shipping a sales order, and then receiving a return against that sales order. And that's all the content that I have, and I think we're right up against the time, so I'm, I'm gonna throw it back to you, Evan. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, we would like to get your feedback on today's session. I've posted a link to a short survey in the Q&A panel. We value your feedback and welcome your input on how we did today and what you would like to see in future sessions. Their survey scores on a scale from one to five, with five being the highest score possible, and we thank you for your participation in that. As a reminder, the recording for today's session will be available on the Tech Talks Community Dynamics page within five business days. 
I'd like to extend a big thank you to our presenter and a thank you to our audience for logging in and joining us today. Please stay safe and have a great rest of your day or evening wherever you are. Goodbye.